Hello everyone and welcome back to my KSP tutorial series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.2. In this episode, I hope to discuss rendezvous and docking, in other words, how two craft meet up with each other in orbit. And to that end, I have unlocked miniaturization, which has the Clampatron docking port junior, so that our craft can dock together with each other. Now, normally when you're going to be trying to do dockings and stuff like that, what you would really like is RCS thrusters, but currently I don't have enough science for that. They allow the fine-tuned control to get the two craft together, so I'm going to have to do it the hard way using my main engine, which is not ideal, and I'm not entirely sure I'm going to be able to do it properly. We'll see. We'll see how close I get. But uh, let's go to VAB, and I have something else to introduce you to as well. Okay, so here we are in the VAB, and you'll notice a little icon here that says KER. That's for Kerbal Engineer Redux, which most people agree is the first mod that you would want to use and that is because it handles a lot of the calculations that you should do to figure out if your rocket can do what you want it to do for you. It'll take care of those calculations and you can just look at a glance to see whether the rocket's gonna work out. Uh, you can do all these calculations by hand. All the equations are fairly straightforward and I have even done those during a live stream so it's not time consuming to do the calculations but but it is handy just to have it all done for you as long as you understand what's going on. So right now Kerbal Engineer is not reading anything. It is the only mod in here right now, so very simple. But uh, once we get a fuel tank and engines on, then it will read something. So let's do that. Um, let's say that much. And our weakest engine, the LB-909. Okay, now it's showing you a bunch of stuff, right? Now we've got the docking port. Actually, I would like a small reaction wheel as well to help turn the thing. The reaction wheels help turn stuff. They have torque in them. See if you right click. Pitch torque, yaw torque, roll torque, but they take electric charge, so we should also have solar panels. This is going to be our docking target, and we'll also push our payload, which will be a Kerbal to that payload's destination. Okay, now we've got a fully functional docking target. And what we see here is the number of parts, the cost, which matches what it says down here, and is most important if you're playing career mode, the total mass, which you can find down here actually, and you can see the parts there too, the ISP, the efficiency of the engine, the terrier, but this is the efficiency in vacuum. And there's the thrust in vacuum, okay? So there's currently the vacuum statistics. Engines operate differently on the ground. And that is because of the pressure from the atmosphere. Atmospheric pressure changes the way engines function. Uh, so here we have the thrust. The torque is if there's some sort of imbalance. If, for instance, let's actually say I move this, whoop, move this to one side, then we'd have a torque. You can see it's imbalanced right now and so we have a torque. So you generally do not want torques. Let's just take that off and make sure we get the new one all nice and centered. And then the thrust to weight ratio. Now for for the series so far I've been telling you to take the thrust and divide it by the mass and if that number is over 10 you're alright. That's the equivalent of saying that if your thrust weight is over 1 you're alright. So basically what this is saying is that our thrust is about 14.8 times our mass. You can uh, take, take a look at that. It's actually a little bit more than that. But um, yeah, so as long as thrust weight is over 1, uh, it will theoretically get off the ground. But you want a little bit of margin. Now, this is our vacuum statistics. Will this really get off the ground? Not really, because atmospheric statistics in the atmosphere with atmospheric pressure shows us that it's only 0.36 much less than one. And ideally you want something between 1.2 and 1.7. You can go higher, though that puts a lot of stress on the craft. 1.5 is sort of nice. Okay, and that's because this LV-909 is not optimized for sea level operation. It's optimized for vacuum. So it's ISP, uh, thrust, ISP, and thrust weight ratio and delta V are all connected together. And so the thrust is not very good, the ISP is not very good at sea level, and therefore you can't get off the ground with this. Uh, it would be nice to be able to get off the ground with this because our delta V, which I've been telling you is how much it costs to get somewhere in space, or change your situation, 
is is quite enough actually to get into orbit. We would need 4,000, but since we can't get off the ground, we can't use it like this. Okay, so to get into orbit, uh, for starters, I would estimate 4,000. I always quote the vacuum figure. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about 3,500 or some other numbers. Some people say 3,200. A lot of the time, the reason they say those numbers and why they seem so low is because they're looking at the atmospheric statistics. Right now, it doesn't make any sense because this can't launch anyway. But let's get a rocket together and I'll show you what it looks like when we've got a real launch stage and you'll see that the Delta V under atmospheric is very different but I'm very consistent I'll always quote to you the requirement in the vacuum Delta V okay let me put the rest of the rocket together alright here we are I've called it docking target and this is the full rocket here we've got two boosters now right now it's reading 8,000 meters per second but we would want to lock these tanks to see just the launch portion and that's a good habit to be in. Just uh, lock the payload tanks, the stuff you want to get into orbit, and don't don't show that uh, so that you get a good sense of what the launch situation is. Here we see that the vacuum delta V is 4,046, which is good. Atmospheric delta V is 3,414. So sometimes people will quote that number, and so that's why there's some confusion. Um, you'll see that while the boosters are running we get 2226 and once the boosters separate we get a, an additional 1187 for the, from the remainder of the core uh, but the core was burning while the boosters were running too okay uh, so that's what it's showing there it shows us that our atmospheric thrust weight ratio which is what you want to look at to see if you can get off the ground is 1.4 so we can get off the ground just fine it's over 1.2 it's definitely over 1 and then once the boosters separate, our thrust weight ratio is 1.55, which is excellent. Okay, now if we restore this, we will see that our thrust weight ratio, well, that's a vacuum stage, so we want to look here. That's 1.48, which is pretty high for space. Space, you don't need a thrust weight ratio of 1. You can have any thrust weight ratio you like, depending on how patient you are. The lower the thrust rate ratio, the longer the burn time, so I could add more fuel to this uh, if I wanted to wait longer. Now, what are we doing with this docking target? Well, what we eventually want to do is rendezvous something else with it. So, there will be another docking port here. And that part will be launched by another launcher. And that could be a Mark I command pod. With, of course, we would need some parachutes. So, let's get two parachutes on it. Okay, something like that with a heat shield. And I'm doing this... Oops, wrong button. I'm doing this so we see how much delta V we're going to have with this. So uh, let's say heat shield. And perhaps uh, maybe it's carrying some science of its own. Something like that. And also its own little like return stage. So it gets pushed somewhere else and then it comes back on its own. That could happen. Okay, now we would want to lock these tanks to make sure that we don't see it. Now it looks like this portion can push all of that with 2,664 delta V, which is great because, you know, it takes like 900 to get to the moon, let's say 1,000 to get to the moon, uh, and then to make orbit it takes another 200. I mean, this is more than enough to go to Duna and back, for instance. In fact, it's enough to actually shoot this over to Jewel. So that's excellent. And that also sort of shows that really this whole docking thing, you only need it for really big vessels. Now, for your normal kind of Kerbal missions, docking things together in orbit, you don't really need. You only need it for really long-range stuff. But anyway, this is the sort of situation. So we have the possibility of sending that to a very far-flung location. Let's launch this first, make sure it works out, make sure the game doesn't crash, and then we will see how to do the rendezvous and docking. And then we'll figure out what kind of mission we want to send it on later on. Alright, so here we go, and what we see here is that Kerbal Engineer has added a bunch of little displays, these HUDs, and I'm going to move this HUD a little bit over here by using the edit here. And you can add different things to the HUDs, but I think the current selection is just fine. The main idea of these things is to avoid jumping to the map constantly, because otherwise we would have to take a look at the map to find our apoapsis and periapsis in particular. And that is information I'd rather not jump to the map to find out. 
It's got orbit information, surface vessel. Um, it used to be that you had to add a part to the vessel in order to have Kerbal Engineer show up like this. I don't know if that's changed or if there's something else going on here. I don't have any other configuration file added. I've just added Kerbal Engineer as it was. So yeah, well anyway, this is how it looks. Uh, so we have our Delta Vs here, but again, there's sea level right now. So don't be fooled. This is not the correct amount of Delta V that we are going to be uh, using. There's also a rendezvous thing here. I, uh, I won't use that. In fact, I will do this as difficult as it's going to get. I'm not going to even look at anything in Flight Engineer. I will just have that information up there. And I'm not going to go into an equatorial orbit. I'm going to go into an inclined orbit to make it a little bit more difficult on myself so that we can get a real challenge here so you can see all the possibilities that might occur and how to deal with them. Alright, so off we go. So everything looking good so far, so I'm going to go into an inclined orbit. So the first thing I'm going to do is roll a bit and I'll go to 45 degrees here and then start my pitch program. Start tilting over very carefully we do not want to flip now you'll know that I put a nose cone on top and the docking port can just eject that nose cone so we'll just uh, slough it off hopefully we do not have fairings just yet so I didn't want the docking port to be presenting a blunt end to the atmosphere that's not very nice now you could probably get to orbit with less delta V than I'm going to use and that's because I'm not going with a particularly good trajectory right now. The more optimized your trajectory is, the less delta V you'll use, and that's largely dependent on, you know, practice with the particular rocket you're using. I'm actually gonna shut down here. We've got uh, good apoapsis, and that's the inefficiency of it. You see, if I was being completely efficient, we wouldn't be getting our apoapsis so early. We would more or less be able to continuously burn to orbit or close to it. The closer we are to continuously burning to orbit, the better our trajectory was. Well, but right now while we're coasting is a great time to get rid of the nose cone. We're out of the atmosphere anyway, so off it goes. So you just click decouple node and it'll go away. You don't need an additional decoupler. Oh! Well, that can happen. You do actually want to sidestep the nose cone. Okay, off go the, ba uh, the boosters. That shocked me a little bit. Now, I am obviously not going to show you all of the functions of Kerbal Engineer right now. So I'm just briefly introducing you to it. There is another mod that does more things. It, uh, it does all of the normal displays that you've seen and more, and that's called MechJeb. Some people find that very controversial because, well, uh, it does all the uh, all sorts of other things and they don't like that. But MechJib in general is more helpful for real solar system and, you know, some of the realism mods. Uh, whereas I generally use Kerbal Engineer for the stock system with Kerbin and no realism mods. Anyway, uh, we're not quite at orbit yet, but we can have this stage descend so it's not space trash. And these tanks are ready, so we will just use some of this fuel to get into orbit. We can time warp to the new apoapsis and finish that off. We'll get into a nice circular orbit, or roughly circular orbit. 129 by 120 is fine. So that's a fairly high orbit. It means that there's a lot of room for our other mission to get below it and catch up to us. Okay, so now if I wanted to make this easy on myself, I'd launch the next one right away. But I don't want to make it easy for myself, so I'm going to time warp a bit. And so that the KSC moves out of sync with the orbit of this piece. So you see now, it would be really hard if we were launching from the KSC here to try and match the orbit here. We're going to actually have to wait until the KSC is underneath the orbit of this craft in order to launch again. Now we could do that on the nighttime side 
If we launch on the nighttime side underneath the orbit of the docking target, we would actually want to go southeast instead of northeast. Remember, this time we launched 45 degrees. In that case, we would probably want to launch 135 degrees. But we'll probably wait until daylight just so you can see what's going on. So I've decided that what we should do is try and land on the moon. And I'll probably do the lunar landing in a separate episode, not this one. We'll focus on docking and rendezvous here, and I'll do the moon landing separately. But um, in order to do that, I didn't want to make the lander too tall because we've got these tiny, tiny micro landing struts. And so if I put the Science Junior in, it'll be really tall and unwieldy. Um, as it is, I decided to tuck in the LV-99 a little bit so that the landing struts, when they extend, extend below it. Uh, it's, it's sort of a dodgy business altogether. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, that's the idea. I'm not going to put a nose cone on here, even though it would make the aerodynamics better because it just looks horrible. So we'll leave that be. I could... well, I, I don't have a budget. Maybe if I put a parachute like this, it'll be alright, and that Clampatron can eject the parachute. Yeah, I guess that'll be fine. We'll go like that. Now, you'll notice a problem here. Uh, we've got the wrong Delta V figures, and that's because our staging is incorrect. You see, the LV-909 has ended up in this stage. And so we need to separate that out. We need to get the decoupler for it down. And now we've got three stages. So remember to check your staging. And once we've done that, we see that the thrust weight ratio of the lander stage is pretty high, especially since you can change the body of this, and since we're trying to use this to land on the moon, Wow, for the moon, that's a thrust to weight ratio of 11.5. Okay, so that's 11.5 times what you need to actually get off the ground at the moon. We don't need that much. Uh, so we'll thrust limit the terrier uh, to get it down to maybe around 2-ish. So we'll have it at 2.3. Now, the other engines have to work around Kerbin. So we'll keep them pretty high, but this is a bit overpowered for this small payload. This is a bit much. Um, if we take these off, we'll see that it's not quite enough, though. 3,225 for just this stage. So we can't do a single stage to orbit. That's what that would be. So instead of single stage to orbit, we do uh, a stage plus boosters. Even though this is a little bit too much, we could use the SRBs. Uh, we could use these guys, and those would probably get us uh, lower to more like uh, 4,000 instead of 4,300. It's actually 4,300, the uh, engine should be like that. But we'll go like this to keep the launcher consistent. And also, it will take a little bit more to get into orbit because we're going into that inclined orbit. Ah, I attached it to the wrong tank. Yeah, that's another thing you have to think about. If you're going to a polar orbit or an inclined orbit, it costs more than the normal amount. So you'll have to account for that. But this is going to be more than enough, obviously. Alright, uh, this is a pretty high thrust weight ratio. Well, it's 1.43 and then 1.7 on uh, afterwards. I think we, we might be willing to tone down the center portion to about... Let me say 74. 74 is good. You'll note that actually that increases our delta V. So what's happening here, the reason why the delta V uh, goes up is because this engine is spending more time in vacuum. It's spending more time at the higher level. So it's spending more time with the 320 second ISB instead of the 270. So that results in the higher delta V. So keep that in mind. Uh, you don't want to be too overpowered in the atmosphere. As long as you get through the thick part of the atmosphere quickly, uh, you're more, you're better off having your nice high ISP in vacuum. And so that's why I'm thrust limiting it like that. Now, where exactly the ideal point is on the thrust weight ratio, you'll have to test it out. It's based on your rocket and its aerodynamics. The sleeker your rocket is, the less thrust to weight ratio you need to uh, get through the atmosphere quickly. Okay, so, yep, let's take this out to the launch pad, who's going to be our crew. I'll have uh, Valentina do this, I think. Okay, let's go.
Now, I don't have any comm devices. I fully expect to bring Valentina back. Oh, I forgot to dump the mod propellant. You know, while I'm here, this time I will dump the mod propellant. So hold on a sec. Okay, here we are. I have dumped the mod propellant. Mod propellant is what would be used for the RCS thrusters. So, so that would be used for docking normally. But since we don't have RCS thrusters, we can't do that. We can see that we're not in line with the target. We should set that as a target. We can time warp until we are in line with it. You can use uh, Kerbal Engineer's rendezvous stuff, but I'm deliberately going to hide that so that I don't rely on it. And I explain this without any reliance on it. We would want our target to be slightly behind us, and then we would catch up. Right now it's really far behind us, but it is sort of more important for us to be touching the orbit than for the target to be closer. Okay, the most important thing is that you're in line with the orbit. Now, if it so happens that the target orbit is equatorial, you can wait until the docking target is like right around here-ish and then launch. That'll make it easier to catch up. But in this case, we've got that inclination to deal with. Now, we've set that as a target, so we see that that's the anti-target marker. And that's, so, that's the opposite direction as a target. So the target marker is somewhere on the other side of the nav ball. Anyway, throttling up. SAS is on. Let's go. Now, in this case, we know what heading I went in to set the target to where it is. So we know that we're supposed to go around 45 degrees, so let's turn that way. You note that the anti-target marker is at 255-ish. It's on the opposite side there, and that makes sense. Now I'll probably demonstrate another docking once I get RCS unlocked, so that you can see how that works. This is going to be a bit harder, but it's good to practice this kind of docking as well when you don't have RCS. It's a rather more touchy and difficult. Now we want to get this into a lower orbit than the other one. And the lower orbit will move faster. So the higher the orbit, the slower it'll go. We got that one that's a docking target into a high orbit. So if we get this one into a lower orbit, then this one will catch up with that one. Now if the target's already in a low orbit, you will want the next launch to be in high orbit. Now here we go, we've uh, got this going here, and it looks like we've got a 5 degree difference there. So I didn't do a very good job. You can take a look at the orbit marker. It seems like what we need to do, we're a little bit far south, right? It looks like that orbit is further north than the one we've got. So what we want to do is tilt a little bit north now. And we can correct. And you can see the difference by hovering over the node, and that difference is going down, but it won't be perfect. And that's because I was a little bit late on my launch. That's fine. As long as it's not too bad, it's, it can be workable. You will always have an intersect point with the target, and that will be at the ascending or descending node. That's where you can change your inclination if you need to. Now again, once the ascending or descending node float away, you can see it's floating away and head to 90 degrees, I can't correct it anymore. So here we're getting to a 90 degree angle between us and the node, which will be here. And so I really can't correct it more than that, but we're only one degree difference from it, so that's not too bad. These, these rockets are, well, they're, they're done actually. It so happened that I finished them off just then, so I'm going to separate. Okay. Uh, uh, I really don't want them bonking me again. So, let me get in the line. Now, I didn't put much electric charge on here. Let me go forward a bit. Oh, well, now we're close to Apoapsis, so I should just start burning. Now, I'm definitely going to want to discard this stage, even if it has fuel left over in it, because it would be really hard to dock with this huge thing on. The smaller the craft, the easier it is to dock with it. I should get rid of the parachute, but I'll wait until we finish this burn. Okay, 
we are in a 106 by 80 orbit, which is definitely lower than our target all the way around. Right, our target's at 120 by 129, so we will catch up with it. Our relative inclination is 1 degree, so we will have to correct that at some point. But there are a number of points that we can correct that. We can correct that at the node, or we can correct that right when we arrive at the target if we can manage it. But for now, we're focused on just catching up. So let's do that. We're going to time warp. You can see... We are going to uh, close in on the target as we go around. It might take some time. And in fact, uh, if it takes too much time, you might want to go back to the tracking station to wait instead of waiting on the map. Because at the tracking station, you can time warp faster and uh, you won't be limited by what orbit you're in. Right now, because we're below 120 kilometers, we can't time warp faster than 50x. Now, you might wonder how you rendezvous without you know the markers and maneuver nodes which you have to unlock at a certain point in career mode in career mode you might not have this marker and stuff like that and frankly the only way to do it in that case is to eyeball it so you'll have to take a look at the lines and go okay well i'm further north or further south and try to adjust and uh, go like that and it'll be a lot harder but I've already done a video on it it was part of my beta tutorial series in KSP.90 I rendezvoused with a target without having the maneuver nodes. Uh, in general, I would recommend not trying that if you're new to KSP. That's sort of an advanced KSP thing. So first unlock maneuver nodes and then try to do the rendezvous. is probably the way to go unless you're really experienced at this. Okay, right about here we see that we're pretty close to our target now. And so what we need to do is touch the target's orbit at some point, right? We're not going to be able to rendezvous with it if we don't come into contact with the target's orbit at all. Right now, we're not coming into contact with the target's orbit at all. We, we are at a lower orbit all the way around. The place to change this is one of the nodes. So here at the descending node, I'm going to pull the prograde vector so that the opposite side touches the target's orbit. Now, that means that one side of the orbit is still going to be lower, which means we're still catching up. If somehow we got ahead of the target, we would want to get into a higher orbit. So, in that case, we would actually boost up further. But for now, I'm just going to touch the target's orbit like that. And you can see that we get an intersect point, just like we did with the moon. And here it's showing me that the intersect, well, the target position at, hold on. There's two markers. This is the target's position, and that's the intersect, which means the target is still ahead of us, which is fine. We are in the lower orbit, so we're still catching up. Okay, and it'll be 37 kilometers. That's okay. And so on the nav ball, we see a little blue marker, and we turn towards it, and it's in 1 minute and 50 seconds. Now, to get it closer, we can adjust the ascending node or descending node. So we're still 1 degree off. Since this is the descending node, I pull the top one, and you see now I can set it to zero. I should be able to get it to zero. There we go. All right, you do not have to do that. You could wait until you actually get there to correct it. And uh, actually, I will leave a little bit of uh, error in order to show how that works. So let's say 0.7 difference. That's fine. Okay. So we'll correct only 0.3 of it, and I'll show you what happens if we still have an inclination difference. So you don't have to correct it. If it's a, if it's a large inclination difference that you still have, uh, it might not be worthwhile to correct it. You might want a different technique because you're running out of fuel for some reason. So we'll go with that. In this case, I'm not going to follow the node marker in particular. All we really needed to do was lift our orbit up a bit. And we see, having gotten rid of the maneuver node, that we're 35.5 kilometers away. Relative speed is 104.8 meters per second. That means I'm going to need to use 104.8 meters per second of delta V to match speeds with the target right now. And if we take a look at Vessel, we have 1,248. Now, we're going to want to use that 1,248 to also make our final touchdown on the moon, take off from the moon, and return back to Kerbin. So we can't use too much of that, but we're expecting we're going to use 104.8 meters per second there right now. We're not actually going to use that much because we still have another burn to make. 
Let's continue to catch up. See, we're still behind. We will catch up. Once we reach that point, it'll update us on what's going to happen on the next orbit. And here, we see we are 47.8 ahead. So having seen that, I'm going to add a maneuver here. And I'm going to lift up our orbit on that side, because that's the side that's lower than the target's orbit. And reduce how much I'm catching up, because I'm going too far ahead. Oops. And sometimes Kerbal does not want to show me what's going to happen. Uh, okay, hold on. Okay, so... We can see that there's supposed to be something good there. But it doesn't want to show it. Well, it's, that's because it's showing this one here. 9 kilometers. 7 kilometers. 5 kilometers. Well, since it doesn't want to show me that one, which would be the better one. I don't know why it's not showing me that one right now. I'll take the 5 kilometer gap for now. Okay. And you see here, right now, our relative speed will only be 35.1 meters per second. So we're not going to be using the 100 meters per second like it showed us before. And that's because we we were being patient. So let's just uh, use the 80, oh, well, 8.9 meters per second here. And we can see the target's velocity now. It, uh, you can shift between orbit, surface, and target. And once you get close to your target, you'll see the relative velocity to the target is 96 meters per second. So let's see what happens when we get over there. We should get some other marker on this side, hopefully. Over there, we've got uh, 5.3. So again, over here, I'm going to... I'm not even going to plot it this time. Going to either go prograde or retrograde. That's not prograde. I'm just going to uh, go with the orbit, not the target. Once we get to within two kilometers of the target, we will focus on the target. For right now, I'm interested in my orbit. Now that's putting us further away. So I'm going to go retrograde. 3.9. You know, I think I'll take 3.9 and proceed like that. Uh, the part of the reason why we still have a 3.9 instead of like a 2 kilometer is because we've got this 0.7 degrees. So I'll accept that and we'll see what we need to do there with that gap. So we've still got an inclination difference, which means there is this sort of vertical gap between our orbit and the targets. It's pretty close over here because we're close to a node where the stuff crosses. And so now we are very close to the target. And our relative speed is only 27.8 meters per second. The target's right there. And so what we do is we turn towards the negative relative velocity. It's the same as the retrograde marker. It's this one. But now that we're focused on the target, it's not our orbital retrograde. It's the retrograde with respect to the target. And we are going to kill all of the difference between us and the target. So we're going to zero that out. And that will correct the inclination too. But we're not going to catch up to it anymore if we just leave it be like that. Now with some of the other readouts, for instance, maybe with Flight Engineer's Rendezvous readout or MechJab or Better Burn Time has a nice readout, you will get other information that will help you with this. But once we've got close to zero, we can turn towards the target, and that's this marker, this pink marker here, is towards the target, and then we go to map view, and the other readouts will help you avo uh, uh, avoid having to go to map view. I'm going to burn towards the target now. And you can see the prograde marker approaching the target, and there it shows a possible happy situation, but I'm going to get the prograde marker directly on the target marker. And so, because the prograde marker is on this side of the target, I'm going to tilt to this side of the target to burn. Okay, so now the prograde marker is right on the target, or close to it. And it says separation 3.4 kilometers, that's not good enough. And it's sort of straying away. So we want to use a little bit more fuel to make sure it's closer. And for now I'll be satisfied if it's below 2. But let's see how far we can get it. 
but you don't want to be going too fast. See, now we've got a relative velocity of almost 15 meters per second. Well, that means we're going to have to use 15 per second of delta V potentially in order to correct that. Now it's ticking down, um, and that's because of the particular way that our orbit is related to the target. It'll tick down, and then uh, on the opposite side of the orbit, it'll tick up again. But now we're at a separation of 0.6 kilometers, which is excellent. And you might want to just keep it in map view and time warp here. It says we'll reach that in 5 minutes and 35 seconds. So let's just go over there. And again, by that point, because it's ticking down, our relative speed will be 6 meters per second. So here it is, 6 meters per second. And once again, we go through the process where we will first kill the velocity and then go towards the target. Now, you could try and do both. Uh, obviously, that would mean like burning right here. See, uh, that's between killing the velocity and pointing towards the target. So let's see what happens when we burn like this. You can see that what it has done is brought my prograde vector towards the target like I want it to be. So that's a little bit more efficient. And we can adjust that again. Make sure that we get the prograde vector on the target. Don't go too fast here though. At 10 meters per second, you've only got 50 seconds to react to whatever might happen with the target. So let's not go that fast. So I'm going to go anti the target or at the retrograde vector and slow down a bit. I want a little bit more time to react if things go wrong. Actually, uh, things are already a little bit wrong because my docking port's not free. I forgot to get rid of that parachute. So let me slow down a bit. That'll give me about a minute. Let me get rid of that parachute. There it goes. Right now, we're nowhere near in line with the docking port of the target. So we want some gap between us and the target so we can figure out our situation. Okay, let's park it here. So in relation to the target, parking it means basically zero meters per second. If we take a look at the target, we see its engine is there. And so the docking port's up there. Oh, the parachute's coming back. Watch out, space debris. So. I've selected the docking port. I'm going to select the docking port as a target. Okay, now is docking part of it. And this is in three dimensions. And what you'll want to do is to make sure to handle one dimension at a time. If we take a look, we are we're sort of horizontally in this direction. We, we need to move this away a little bit more, right? So I'm going to turn my capsule this way. Now with RCS thrusters, you don't need to turn the capsule. With RCS thrusters, what you'll do is you will actually face the docking port. See, um, something around like, like that. Seems like that's the direction of the docking port. You see, the docking port is on the target's nose here. And so here, I would be in line with the docking port. And I'll just use my RCS thrusters to push myself this way. But I don't have those thrusters, so I actually need to turn this way and go a little bit further like this. So I'm going to take care of that one dimension first. I'm going to make sure I'm in line with the target in this direction. I'm going to be ready to stop that once I seem to be in line with it. It's in the dark right now, sorry about that. I One other mod that I should have introduced is ambient light adjustment. Now I could turn the target towards us and that would make things easier, but again, I'm not trying to make things easy on myself here. Okay, taking a look at the orientation of the target, it seems to be pointed at us right now, so I'm going to stop this. Actually, I want to completely stop that motion. Now, what about up and down? Well, we seem to be a bit high compared to the target, but not that high. But taking a look at the way the target's pointing, it's actually pointing right at us pretty close. But if we were a little bit higher, we would take our capsule. Let's focus in on it. 
and point down just a little bit and we would go down but in this case we weren't very far off in this direction so I'm just gonna stop it now let's approach the target so that's the third dimension the third dimension is getting closer to the target and we can do that just by pointing at the target target marker sorry my camera is a little bit off now see now we're pointing at the target the targets roughly pointing at us it'd be nicer to do this in full daylight let's see there's a good camera so you see we've corrected those two and now we're sort of pointing at the target pretty close but let's approach cautiously and we want our prograde vector to be directly in line with the target remember we have targeted the docking port Now that we're going pretty fast here, you can see that. And we might need to make some further adjustments. So I'm going to turn tail on it. So that now we've got daylight, so that's good. So that once we get really close, I can make some further adjustments. And again, once you've got RCS thrusters, you don't need to do all this turning. You'll just use I, J, K, L to go from side to side, and then H and N to go forward and back is how you do it. So I would have uh, just faced the docking port and pressed N there with the RCS thrusters. Now it seems like we are a little bit low, taking a look at this camera angle. So I'm going to go 9 degrees away, I'm going to push a little bit, just a little bit and then pretty much immediately correct. Now with the RCS thrusters you just put push I, J, K or L in the correct position and I'll, I'll show a docking with RCS some other time once we've unlocked it like I said. Okay how about side to side? Well we're a little bit off to the side aren't we? So I'm gonna point it a little bit here quickly correct Unfortunately, it's not really showing my retrograde marker anymore because as long as I'm doing the burns like uh, to like 0.1 meter per second, it doesn't really recognize that. So I've got a bit of a problem there. I really need it to be more... It's like Kerbal is not precise enough for me. It's not very nice. Well, I decided to go down, so it has to be like this that is... Um, Something like that would be right. Yeah. Okay, well, at a certain point, it's good enough. Well, I mean, there's, this should, uh, there's gonna be magnetism between the docking ports. So hopefully it is good enough. Now, I haven't turned the target in any way. What you could do is you could use your bracket keys to switch to the target and have the target well make sure the target has that as a target and then just use the target to turn like this towards us but a very minor correction was necessary a stupid parachute anyway so here we will dock we're a little bit far in that direction hopefully the magnetism will help I could do a little burst here Jump to this side. Make ah, I lost my target. I hate when it does that. Make sure it's tilting towards us properly. Oh, magnetism. There we go. We're docked. So that's with the complicated way. That's everything was really really complicated. That's the hard way to do things. It, it's generally a lot easier with RCS. So I'm gonna lock all of this side's uh, fuel and make sure its engine is not running because we only want that engine running. And I'll just separate that engine out here. Okay, so now we're all docked up. Let's go to the moon and then we will handle the landing on the moon in the next episode. But let me plot the transfer to the moon and then we'll continue from there.
Now the reason I want to handle the transfer to the moon in this episode is because, well, we're in this inclined orbit. We're not in the equatorial orbit anymore. What do you do? I mean, it's, it's got this horrible inclination with respect to the moon. Set moon as a target, 41.4 degree difference. Well, that's horrible. Well, this is where you do the off-plane transfer. Let's see if we can do one here, but possibly we'll have to do it from the descending node. So you start at the ascending node, and try and get the markers to hit right at the descending node on the other side. You might have to be a little bit off from the, from the node, but there we've got a moon encounter. We've got a moon periapsis. And again, you just move this back and forth to try and get it. So if I moved it back, we get further and further away, and then we get this gap, right? So you want to move the node to where they get closer. So it seems like that. And then adjust the prograde and retrograde vector. You don't need to touch any of the other vectors, just prograde, retrograde. And I think a moon periapsis of 56 kilometers is just fine. So if you couldn't get it on one of the nodes, you could uh, start out on the opposite node and try and hit it over here somewhere. And that would take longer. This is going to be a quick trip. And so our relative velocity with respect to the moon will be high, which means we'll have to use a lot more to slow down. Fortunately, we've packed 2,709 meters per second on this stage. So we should be all right. Okay, so let's time warp to the node. So that's how you do it. I mean, if you're in this weird inclined orbit with respect to the target, just pick one of the nodes to try and hit it at, and you can probably manage it. Oops. Look at that. We're controlling from the wrong thing. It thinks... See, we're going in this direction, obviously. And so it thinks that we're going to be using this engine because we're controlling from this capsule. That's wrong. We want to be using this engine, so we should control either from this probodobodyne or this docking port. So control from here, and you see the situation has reversed and actually our node is on the opposite side. So whenever you dock, you have to make sure that you're controlling from the right part. So let's go now. That probably was a little bit late on the burn. We've left a lot of debris in orbit this time. In retrospect, I think maybe I should have sent the Kerbal over to Duna, sent Valentina over to Duna for a Duna landing. I, th I think I said I'd do that, but um, I, I don't think we've done a moon landing. Have we planned a flag on the moon at all? Yeah, I don't think we've planned a flag on the moon, so I think that really should be done first. Okay, you can see the situation building here. And actually, uh, this kind of approach is good because then we can pick our landing spot better. If you're at equatorial, you don't have much choices on which crater you want to hit. But this way we can even land close to the poles. So okay, uh, 49 kilometers is fine. And so we are on our way. Valentina is head out to the moon. And so I'll uh, cover what happens there in the next episode. Uh, so with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.